Let me clear the air a little so that we're all on the same page. I know you're probably wondering why I would even ask something like this. I work as an in-home health aide for the elderly in my community, and up until a few months ago, I hardly believed in the supernatural at all. It started when one of my regular clients, Ronnie, began confusing me with his deceased grandson, Sam. Or at least, that's what I thought was happening. I assumed because Ronnie had recently moved back in with his family, that the memories of him were too great to ignore, so the first few times it happened, I shrugged it off. Third time it occurred, I realized that he wasn't actually referring to me as Sam, but he he seemed to believe that he was in the room with us. That's such a cute bear you have there, he said one day as I pushed his wheelchair to the dining room. I decided to finally address the issue head on. Ronnie, who are you speaking to? I asked as I started to prepare his meal. Sam, of course. He's got a new teddy bear. And he's playing with it, he said, matter-of-factly, gesturing to the empty chair. You believe that Sam's here? Ronnie, do you remember what happened to Sam a few years back? I want to make it clear, I wasn't saying these words to confuse my client or make him feel stupid for his beliefs or even hurt his feelings. He, he was actually... He'd been showing signs of improvement in his memory thanks to some new medicine that his son has him on. In fact, it surprised me more when Ronnie told me exactly what he remembered. Of course I do. Don't treat me like a child. He fell down the stairs. He broke his neck. I was the one who found him, goddammit, he said irritably. But he was also adamant that Sam's spirit was there in the room, some essence. But his grandson remained. I brought up the matter to his family immediately when the wife returned from work that evening. So he believes that he's seeing Sam's spirit? She asked me. There were tears in her eyes. I wasn't under the family's employment when they lost their only child, but just in the short time that I'd been here, I could easily tell that the little boy was loved. Very much. I was just wondering if you wanted me to do anything about it. I mean, it's, it's not exactly healthy for him to exhibit this sort of behavior, I pointed out. I, I'll talk with Martin about it, see what he recommends, but honestly, her voice was quivering as she held back more tears. I, I don't see the harm in it at all. Not one to argue with my employer, I decided to let it drop and played pretend with Ronnie any time that they wanted to claim that Sam was in the room. One time we were out watering his plants, and he had put me on weeding, claiming that he wanted to plant some new tulips for spring. I was feeling particularly irritated with him that day because he kept complaining about how the ghost was asking for things a certain way. Prune those hedges too while you're at it. Sam likes to look out towards the woods. I dropped my tools and glared at the old man. Forgive me for sounding rude, sir, but I'm sick and tired of taking orders from a spirit. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not doing a thing unless your family requests it specifically, I blurted out. Sam is my family, he countered. He doesn't exist. I'm tired of playing make-believe, I argued. I stormed out of the garden away from his wheelchair, too frustrated to argue with the confused elderly man any longer. I walked to the kitchen and grabbed myself a drink, staring at the pictures of Sam on the fridge, ones that were on display. He was a very lively and very happy little boy. I suddenly felt very guilty for not feeding Ronnie's fantasies and walked back to the garden to apologize. That was when I saw him on the ground, like he had had a stroke. I ran over to him and saw his eyes rolled back, and I tried to keep his airways as open as possible as I panicked and reached for my cell phone. Emergency services arrived and took him to the clinic that same afternoon, and I half expected my job to be over when Martin and his wife called me. How is he? How bad was the seizures? I asked. Stroke was only a minor one. Uh, we're calling you to ask if you saw anyone in the garden alongside Dad? Martin answered. Uh, no. Why... What happened? I asked. He showed me the images that the clinic had taken. There appeared to be handprints on Ronnie's neck, indicating that he had been strangled. They sent it over to the police to see if it matches anything in the database still. I, I feel like it might have been a good idea to install security cameras near the back patio, he told me. 
I, I kept staring at the bruises, baffled at how an intruder could have entered and left so quickly without me hearing them. Ronnie didn't remember much of anything about the assault, and I used the next few weeks to guide him through physical therapy. I noticed that he seemed less enthusiastic about anything after the incident, and I found out the reason why when I was reorganizing the upstairs closet. Quite a few toys in here that could go to Goodwill, Ronnie. What do you say? We could get out of the house for the rest of the day and pick up a burger from Steak and Shake? I suggested. Maybe we can find Sam, he said softly. I paused in my duties and climbed off the stepladder to look him dead in the eye. Ronnie, have you not been seeing Sam lately? I asked. Not since the garden. You made him sad and angry and he ran away. He muttered irritably. I gave him a curious look and remarked, Well, maybe I can help him come back. I went to the garden and began to trim the hedges, as he had originally requested, so that he could get a view of the forest. It was the least I could do, given the behavior I had demonstrated. You really think this will bring Sam back? He asked excitedly. Well, we can cross our fingers and hope for the best. Now what do we say we take these toys to Goodwill? I paused and then reconsidered, realizing that some of the items I had boxed up were Sam's. Do you think that Sam would mind if I donate his things? I asked him. I don't know. You have to ask him when he gets back, the old man said. I sighed, realizing that was the response I should have anticipated. It seemed like every effort I was making to appease his fantasy was a step forward, but then a few backward as well. I did as much as I could for Ronnie that week to set things up in the house the way Sam would have wanted. I have to admit, it was odd playing make-believe that I was pleasing a ghost, but it all paid off that Saturday, when we were watching Judge Judy in the den. For a short moment, there was a power outage and I told Ronnie I would go check the breaker. When I got back, I found he was sobbing. He looked toward the nearby window. It looked like someone had opened it just enough to crawl through. What is it? Did, did something happen? I asked, my mind flashing back to the last time I had left him alone. He's back. You did it. Thank God my Sammy's back, he said as he wiped tears away. I walked over to the window and was about to close it. Then he reached out and stopped me. Don't. It, it, it makes him feel locked up, Ronnie told me. The room felt different, and I considered the possibility that there really was a spirit in the room with us. It just felt like there was a presence there, and I had never seen Ronnie happier, so I didn't dispute it. The next week, I kept listening to his demands. Martin and Melody were heading out of town for a business retreat in Colorado, and had told me they would love to have me stay there the whole time to watch after Ronnie. I figured it'd be the perfect time to help him be satisfied with everything that his ghost needed. It started out innocently enough, keeping the air condition low because Sam was too warm, or it was to keep lights on because the spirit was scared of the dark, or watching a certain TV program because it was his favorite. But then he asked me to start bringing a few things down from the attic and decorating Sam's old room. There were boxes of toys up there that just collected dust. Before I did anything major, though, I Skyped Melody to make sure it wouldn't offend him. I know you've done your best to move on from the tragedy, and that's why I figured it was best to talk to you. I explained as I showed her some of the things. Where did you find all of this? Melody asked. Up in the attic, in boxes. Uh, y your dad told me that was where you'd put all the stuff, I explained. She paused for a second as she looked over the items. None of this is Sam's, she decided firmly. What? I asked in confusion. We donated the majority of his things right after he passed. You probably found a few trinkets from the previous owners or something, she explained. I frowned in confusion and told her I had to go. I decided to start doing a little research. When it comes to real estate and the history of a house, there really isn't a better place to look than a local library. Unfortunately, that meant leaving Ronnie alone unattended for a few hours. 
I had made sure that he had everything he needed, started to find out more about the house. It didn't take long for me to find something out of the ordinary. According to the archives I found, the house was owned by a couple for almost 30 years before they mysteriously vanished. Another article said that their son was the one responsible for killing them and then killing himself. Reports of child abuse were filed, but nothing ever actually done about it. Other snippets claimed that the boy was a monster, constantly demanding every little thing from his parents. But it got so bad they locked him in the attic. There was even a picture of the little boy from back in the late 70s. And they had a striking resemblance to Sam. From far off, I would wager they looked identical. In the picture, the little boy had a toy bear. I borrowed a few books, continued the research on, even in front of Ronnie, because what I was learning fascinated me. What are you reading? Ronnie asked as he rolled up behind me. I closed the laptop shut quickly and muttered, just a little mystery novel. I think it's time for your bath. He grumbled, but didn't object as we went to the washroom. While I got everything ready, my mind was making a few connections to the recent events surrounding the ghost that Ronnie had been talking to. A young boy that lost his family. The ghost didn't like to be in the dark or windows closed, locked away with his toys in the attic. I wasn't one to jump to conclusions, but I was starting to believe that, that Ronnie was in contact with a real spirit. But not Sam's. After the bath, I got him some ice cream and sat him on the patio to talk about it. Ronnie, is Sam close by? I asked. Yeah, he's over in the garden trying to catch grasshoppers, he said delightfully. Can you call him over here? I, I wanted to ask him a few things. You know, he gets shy around me, so I figured maybe he would tell you and then, then you tell me, I said. He nodded and waited a moment before asking my final question. How old are you, Sam? Ronnie said, eight. It was the first confirmation I needed. The real Sam was only five when he passed. Still, I pressed onward. Do you miss your mommy and daddy? No. Another confirmation that this wasn't Sam. You don't like having windows closed or being trapped, do you? He says he likes to look at the sun. He doesn't like to be locked away, Ronnie said. I decided to change gears. It was clear that this thing was communicating with me and wasn't afraid of the questions anymore. How long have you lived here alone? 49 years. Ronnie seemed a bit confused by that answer, but I wasn't. That was exactly how long it had been since the boy I read about had died. And what happened to your mommy and daddy? They didn't... Ronnie paused, again disturbed by the answer he had been given. What did he say, Ronnie? I pressed him. They didn't do what I asked, so I shut them up, Ronnie muttered. That doesn't sound like Sam. I kept going, too excited to lose the connection now. Did you hurt Ronnie, too, the other day in the garden? Yes. Why? Didn't do what I said. I like it when he listens, Ronnie said, and then muttered, I don't like this anymore. Stop with the questions. I obliged him and wheeled him inside, feeling my heart beat faster as I turned on his favorite soap opera and walked back towards the garden. Whatever presence was there with me, it didn't feel friendly. I looked down towards the grass and saw a few crumples of flowers. The spirit was angry that I had called their bluff. Ronnie's a good man. Leave him alone. We don't want you here. Do you hear me? I screamed out. I don't know what I expected to happen. Maybe some poltergeist shit? Stuff fly around the backyard? I walked back inside and slammed the door shut, feeling proud of myself. That night, though, the spirit retaliated. I slept in the room across from Ronnie, 
and I heard him making noises in the night. Normally, that means he wants to go to the bathroom, so I went in there to see what he might need, only to find that he seemed to be choking on something. I ran over to his side of the bed and used the Heimlich maneuver to make the food come up, but once he fully recovered, I saw that it looked like someone had tried to make him swallow a toy part. He looked around the room anxiously as Ronnie recovered. The window was open, and I swear I saw a shadow cross in front of it. I resolved to sleep there in his room that night. In the morning, things got worse. Ronnie was trying to take a shower, and the water constantly got boiling hot. He even cussed a few times at me, and then some of his things were going missing. He even started to blame me. And where the hell's Sam? I haven't seen him yesterday since you interrogated him, he muttered. I decided it was time to come straight with Ronnie. He seemed like he was in a good state of mind to talk sense to, so I, I told him about the spirit and how he had been lied to. Much to my surprise, he was even angrier than me. What we need is a damn exorcist, he suggested. I told him I'd look into it, but the search I made seemed to turn up very few results. It's not like this is something you could just find in the yellow pages. Later that afternoon, I saw that Ronnie had been locked out of the house somehow. I apologized to him. I told him that it must have been that spirit again playing tricks on us. Are you crazy? Sam was with me the whole time. He was as upset with me that we were locked out, Ronnie muttered. I froze as I looked past the old man and realized the ghost was toying with him again. I told you to leave us alone, I muttered angrily at the old phantom. Don't talk to my grandson that way. I'll have you know, I can have you replaced, Ronnie remarked. I shook my head in desperation, realizing the ghost had managed to trick him again and make him think this really was his grandson. I decided my only option was to perform the exorcism myself. I'm not going to lie, looking up bizarre rituals and possessions online felt out of place for me. I mean, never made a lick of sense. But after a few hours of dabbling here and there, I found a few solid leads on the proper ritual to undertake to clean a house. I decided to do it the next day when Ronnie took a nap. I didn't want him to have a heart attack if the ghost decided to fight back. I finished all the preparations around 3.30 that afternoon and called out to the spirit. Some part of me expected that maybe it was just going to leave of its own accord when it saw the different measures I had taken to ward it off. Instead, the vicious ghost attacked me with full force, starting to levitate objects and tossing them towards me as I began to chant the necessary words. I heard screaming. I looked toward Ronnie, worried that he would wake up to see the mysterious force that was wrecking his home. I kept going. I could feel something tightening their grip around my chest and neck, the same way Ronnie had been attacked in the garden. I finished the spell just as I was about to lose air, and then... Everything in the house grew silent. Windows shattered, and wind rushed out. I felt a chill run down my spine, and then... Nothing happened. Ronnie woke with a start, clearly confused by the mess. I told him it was burglars, and he returned to sleep. I spent the rest of the day cleaning up, feeling rather proud of myself for having accomplished something so... mystical. That was about a week back, and we haven't heard from the spirit since. I mean, you'd think that would be good news, but... I see Ronnie... The way he used to be when I first came here. Distant, forlorn. Looking out towards the woods as though expecting to see his grandson again. Martin and Melody have asked me why he no longer speaks about Sam. And I haven't had the heart to explain exactly what happened. Or that it was never Sam to begin with. I sat down and I talked with Ronnie a few days ago. A little heart to heart to figure it all out. You miss him, don't you? I asked. Every damn day. Sammy was a light in my life, Ronnie muttered. I miss him too, Ronnie. But the thing that was here with us, it wasn't Sam, I told him. He looked at me confused. It wasn't my Sammy. What are you talking about? Do you think I wouldn't know my own grandson? He tried to hurt you, I told him. It was an accident. I fell. Sam would never hurt me. Not my Sam. 
He paused and then looked at me angrily. You. You. You're the reason he's gone, he muttered. Ronnie, I was trying to protect you. It was a lie. It, it wasn't Sam. He looked down at his hands, sad and defeated. Maybe it wasn't, he admitted. Then he curled his lips up and tears trickled down his cheeks. Why did he have to go? He was hurting us, Ronnie, I repeated to him. His eyes glazed again in confusion as he started to repeat, Bring him back. I miss him. I couldn't let the argument linger any further. I asked Melody if there was anything I could do to help make this right. I told you before, let him have his fun. That ghost was the world to him. Why would you take it away? But if it wasn't Sam, I asked her. She didn't seem to quite understand what I was asking. But her answer is what spurred my inquiry here. I mean, I looked online, I tried as hard as I can for the past few days to find anything that might reverse the spell, but I haven't found anything. And Ronnie's only gotten more and more detached from all of us. He hardly eats, he hardly even talks. The only time he even has a bit of color on his face is when we go to the garden. I keep the shrubs trimmed so that he can look towards the woods. And maybe there's an off chance that something might find its way here, to bring comfort to him again. Yeah, I, I know it sounds foolish let a spirit wander into our lives or to wish that a particularly dangerous one could return, but I thought about it for a while and I... I don't think it would do us harm if we do as it asks. You know, it probably doesn't make sense to you, but if you saw Ronnie, if you saw the way his eyes glazed over when we put away the old trinkets into the attic again, you'd know why this matters so much. It wasn't Sam, you know, I told him as I closed the attic door. It was one last attempt to help him see the truth. Ronnie grew even sadder as he looked down at the floor. He repeated what his daughter-in-law had said almost exactly. Even if that's true, to me it was him. So why take that away from me? He asked. I couldn't find an answer to that question. I still don't have one. Maybe I'm not meant to. So, I ask again on behalf of a lonely and sad grandfather. Does anyone know if you can reverse an exorcism? Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. This past year has been rough. I've been gone for quite a while trying to get things um, organized for my own life, and Patreon subscribers, you guys who subscribe everywhere, th this, this has kept me afloat in turbulent waters. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause. Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all you guys and everybody who's included in the description down below, thank you so much for everything that you guys have done for me, and thank you so much for being here when times get difficult. <laughs> and I can't always be around to make content. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. And that goes to everybody who watches these videos, that goes to everybody who's subbed here, and anybody who has <laughs> ever liked a creepypasta story ever. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.